Hi guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Sorry, we had some technical glitches as we are broadcasting from our brand new studio. We're really excited to have you guys join us today. My name is Marianne Hensley and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Freight Waves. And we are excited to be here and happy to present this webinar in partnership with Convoy, which is dedicated to bringing reliability, transparency, and efficiency to the trucking and supply chain industry. Today, we're gonna to be touching on a number of factors affecting freight today, and we're gonna be hearing from Craig Fuller, CEO and Managing Director of Freight Waves, as well as our Chief Economist, Ibrahim Bayan. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the webinar that you would like to ask our speakers, please reach out through the Q&A button in your Zoom webinar control panel. And if you have any technical issues, please reach out to us through the chat function in your Zoom control panel. And without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Craig and Ibrahim to share their thoughts on the latest factors affecting freight today. So Ibrahim, I'm really excited to be here, brand new in the studio. Unfortunately, we were having a little bit of technical difficulties. So sorry about that. Uh, if you can't hear us, um, we, we uh, will try to address that. Yeah, I'm glad to be here, Craig. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, always good to be back to talk about some of the recent developments that have been going on in the economy. Uh, and interested in getting into some of the things that are affecting freight markets today. So, Ibrahim, um, it's been a bit since we've been together. So, um, but excited to have you. For those that don't know, Ibrahim is our chief economist. Uh, uh, came from UPS and has spent uh, the last decade and a half in the industry. That's right. Uh, quite a bit of transportation experience, interested in, in, in trucking and, and glad to, to get the opportunity to get in front of you guys every month. Well, uh, real quick, the next time we'll be together, we'll be at Transparency 18, uh, 19, I forget what year it is, uh, down in Atlanta. So that's exciting. I can't wait. So we're going to, uh, we have a lot of really uh, great speakers coming uh, to that particular event. Uh, Brad Jacobs is going to uh, kick it off. Actually, Gary Vaynerchuk is going to kick it off, but we also have Brad Stone the author of Jeff Bezos' uh, book, uh, uh, the biography about Jeff Bezos. Uh, we have Andy Clark, the CFO of Seth Robinson, uh, and Shelly Simpson, uh, the Chief Commercial Officer, along with 70 other speakers. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, so a little bit about Freight Waves is we're building a community that's dedicated to using data and technology to understand how companies react, forecast, and ultimately de-risk the market. Uh, we actually up to 25 market reporters and we're adding two or three more over the next couple of days. Uh, so a lot of stuff happening here internally. We just moved into our new headquarters and unfortunately we had a couple of small little technical difficulties which we'll help to fix next time. And then of course uh, we argue that our strength is using a combination of data and what we like to describe as tribal knowledge which is all about experience and understanding what's happening in the freight market. So. To get us started, I think we're going to dive into the first quarter performance, we're going to talk about manufacturing, international trade uh, struggles, uh, rebounding retail, uh, talk a little bit about why you believe it could be strong growth ahead, right? Right. I, I, I think uh, the first quarter was, was, was pretty poor by anybody's estimation, but I think there's good enough reason to suspect that things will be better going forward. Uh, and then we're going to talk about freight capacity and pricing, and then touch on regional freight patterns. So I think you have a, a couple of thoughts to sort of summarize where things are at. Sure. So, I mean, generally speaking, I think it's pretty clear that the economy lost some momentum in, in the first quarter, especially as it relates to freight movements. Uh, you know, the GDP numbers will, will be out next next week um, and they'll, they'll probably show a decent pace of growth. Uh, but I think the situation was a bit worse for freight than it was for the economy overall. Um, some positive signs emerging out of the retail sector, uh, although trade and manufacturing growth are still struggling in the economy. Housing and construction has still been a, a weak area thus far in, in 2019. Uh, and, and when we're looking at uh, rates within trucking, they're, they're coming down. And I, I think there's good enough reason to suspect that they're going to keep going down going forward. That's a bad news. Uh, if you're, well, it's bad news if you're buying capacity. I mean, <laughs> sorry, selling capacity. It, all the, all uh, good news if you're buying. That's the thing about any type of market is there are winners and losers. Uh, spot rates uh, are continued under pressure, is my summary to Craig. Uh, contract rates are not yet under pressure. The question is, will they be? And there's uh, some school of thought that says that traditionally spot rates do uh, sort of lead the contract rate, but there are uh, some people that I respect that actually have different theories. We'll dive into that a little bit here later. Um, I 
would subscribe to spot rates do tend to lead contract rates. I'm not sure that I have uh, taken that view, but we'll talk about it. Um, more capacity has been added uh, and demand growth is not enough to soak up the capacity that has been added. But the good news is, and this is, a, I think, so, I wouldn't call surprising, but certainly encouraging, is that volume is up 18 basis points year over year. Well, I think it's definitely good news uh, after the beginning part of the year. I think most people thought that, that things were <laughs> falling. Well, they look like they were, and I think even our, our data is tracked that uh, there had been some uh, uh, since uh, year over year was was actually down. So we're seeing a little bit of rebound in the market. Uh, and things to watch, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, and certainly things to watch for the rest of the year is EMO 2020 has come into effect uh, at the end of the year, or, or I guess Jan December, sorry, December 31st, January 1st. Uh, will be the uh, the date that EMO 2020 is implemented. Uh, AOBR, we are back to the ELD issue. Uh, are AOBRs going to uh, impact the capacity map? Uh, you know, as much as 30% of capacity is still on a AOBRs, and the question is, will that convert, and what does that look like? I guess there is, I shouldn't say will it convert, it's going to have to convert, but what does the, uh, uh, what does that do to the market? And of course, trade policy and border closures or the hint <laughs> of border closures that have taken place. So things to watch, Ibrahim, I will let you dry. Sure, so um, just to get started quickly talking about what, where we are in the economy, uh, the fourth quarter growth uh, in the US economy was re revised down over the last month down to 2.2%. Uh, you can see that's significantly slower than what we saw in the middle part of 2018. And I think the first quarter probably comes in around that pace. Now, for a while, I thought uh, first quarter GDP was going to fall in the 1.5% range, but some better data coming out of retail, some better data from a growth perspective coming out of international trade has bumped that up a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, I expect the growth kind of stays around this 2% uh, range going forward as well. So it's not great growth, uh, but it is positive growth. So that's always something. So you're not using any, I mean, this is positive, right? Yeah, so it's expansion. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, from a freight perspective, what, where some of the positives are going to come from in the second quarter, I think retail spending overall is going to be stronger in the second quarter than it was in the first quarter. I mean, even with this morning's positive retail results, there was, there was only um, slight growth overall during the first quarter in, in the retail sector. There should be more inventories flowing into the actual economy. I mean, we've, we've talked a, a bunch over the past couple of months about how imports um, surged at the end of 2018 and ended up being st being stored in inventory. And, and I, I still think there's there's a good amount of that inventory that's just kind of sitting on, on the coast waiting to get the, unleashed into the, the rest of the economy. I think that that begins in the second quarter uh, into the third quarter. And then I also think that import and export volumes are, are going to begin to pick up, uh, especially on the import side. Like I think once uh, once some of the, the tariff related fluctuations work their way through, you should see better import growth going in and that should help freight demand also. Now, there are some weaknesses in the second quarter. Business investment hasn't shown any signs of picking up. Um, it, it slowed down considerably at the end of 2018 into the beginning parts of 2019. And I don't think it gets necessarily much better in the, in the second quarter either. There's still this overarching cloud of trade policy uncertainty uh, that exists in the economy, which is weighing down a, uh, a lot of business investment. And it's just kind of slowing down economic activity in general. And I think that probably persists in the second quarter. Although recently there's been some talk about potentially uh, some some deals on the, on the trade front that could clear some of that up. So uh, starting with the manufacturing sector, um, the first quarter was a very rough period for the manufacturing sector. There were declines in both January and February in manufacturing activity um, before essentially a flat reading in, in when the March data was released earlier this week. Uh, year over year growth is now at 1%. That's considerably slower than where it was in the third quarter of last year. I mean, last September it was close to 4% growth year over year. Um, and so to see it drop from 4% to about 1% year over year in such a short time frame, uh, I mean, that's part of the reason why the freight environment feels as, as, as felt as weak as it did during the first quarter. Um, you know, the manufacturing environment is still suffering from this reduced business investment uh, that, that's going on in the economy and also a, just a generally poor export environment during the first part of the year. I mean, global growth isn't, hasn't been uh, proceeding at a, 
at a decent enough clip. The dollar is also uh, quite a bit stronger than, than what it was, uh, say, a year and a half ago. And all that's weighing on export performance, which in turn filters into manufacturing activity in helping to contribute to, to just the weak results uh, in the manufacturing sector. The hard results that are coming from manufacturing production, they, they're, they're loosely being reinforced by some of the survey data. Although I would say that, you know, generally speaking, the data coming out of the Institute of Supply Manager, this is the ISM index for manufacturing here, uh, it's been a bit better than what the, what the manufacturing growth rates have been. Like normally if you get readings of about 55 out of the ISM manufacturing sector, uh, th that usually translates to about trend-like growth, which is pretty close to 2% or slightly above 2% for manufacturing. So to get like this 1% growth combined with better readings for the ISM, there's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, the service data has been better it, it just in general. It retreated a little bit in, in March, but the service sector, I think, has sustained the economy during most of the week periods in this post-recession era. Um, and I don't think there's any signs of any significant slowdown in service activity there either. Um, now, looking forward for the manufacturing sector, one of the things I like to track is just uh, taking a look at, man at factory orders. Um, this is a piece of data that the Census Bureau releases every month, and it just tells you, you know, how many orders these manufacturers are receiving uh, every month. Uh, I have it here broken down uh, from durable goods and non-durable. The, the white line here is durable goods, excluding transportation. The orange line is just non-durable goods. Um, the reason why I, ex I exclude transportation from orders is because aircraft is such a big component of, of total durable goods and aircraft orders fluctuate uh, quite a bit month to month and it's not even seasonal. I mean, just, just unseasonable spikes happen all the time in aircraft orders. So to avoid that noise, just kind of eliminate that uh, that category from it. Now, will the, will the Boeing uh, MAX issue have any impact on this? It, it, it should going, going forward. I mean, we'll, we'll kind of see how Boeing reacts to things. Um, like how they're able to, to adjust by having to shut down the, the 737s. But um, I mean, it, it does filter in there. Now, um, one thing to notice about durable goods is that it's, it's essentially stalled. I mean, these are levels, these aren't, these aren't growth rates here. And, and what really beginning in the fourth quarter of last year, durable goods orders have kind of seized up and they, they haven't advanced anymore after growing throughout the, the first three quarters of 2018 at a pretty strong clip. And so when you're looking at sort of the weak results out of manufacturing, I mean, really this was already written uh, from the from the poor orders readings that existed uh, in, in the latter part of last year. And, and a similar sort of story on the non-durable side that, uh, I mean, non-durable orders actually declined over the past several months uh, before they picked up a bit in, in the February data that was released. And so, you know, just this idea that, you know, manufacturing is in a pretty poor place at the, at, at the start of the year. Now, this factory order data, um, it, it's one of the pieces of information that's still being delayed a bit by the government shutdown. I mean, the government shutdown, we've, we've, we've long passed it. But these statistical agencies, they're still trying to catch up to, to all of that stuff. So the last data point here is February. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be watching pretty closely to see whether or not that, you know, these orders pick up over the next couple of months to coincide with my view. But I think manufacturing will probably pick up a bit uh, going forward as well. Um, just to give you an idea of why orders data is so important, uh, I put up factory orders and factory shipments. So, so factory shipments is going to tie very closely to freight movements from, uh, among manufacturers. Uh, here, the, the white line here is, the, is, is, or, is durable goods orders. Uh, and then the orange line is durable goods shipments. And historically, you can sort of tell what the shipments are going to do a month in advance by looking at what the orders are going to do. I mean, there's, there's very few correlations <laughs> in macroeconomic data. Uh, that are as tight as these these two things. And so when you see orders die down, it's a good sign that shipments are about to die down. And when orders pick up, it'll be a sign that, that shipments will begin to pick up in the economy. Uh, and the order data suggests soft manufacturing, again, through the first quarter, we'll be watching to see whether or not it picks up. So, so freight companies are probably going to see softer just uh, volumes because of this data that you just did. Well, I mean, if this wasn't delayed data, I'd probably agree. But the problem is that, like, the last data point is still February. Okay. And so it, it kind of reinforces the idea that March was pretty weak and yeah. the other parts of April are still kind of subdued. Uh, normally, we'd have more current data at this, at this point in time. You'd be able to, to say more things about what the outlook looks like for the middle part of the second quarter. So switching gears to retail, 
Um, you know, this, this actually was, was updated just a couple of hours ago. That, so th this chart is uh, including last month's data, but the, the retail sales results were released from March this morning. Um, retail sales had been doing pretty poor during the first part of the year. I mean, really dating back to this, the, the plunge in activity that occurred in December, um, retail never really found its footing through the first couple of months of this year. The good news is that the March data that came out this morning was very strong. It was one of the biggest gains in, in retail sales. Uh, since uh, like the, the third quarter of 2017. Um, and so that, that, I mean, and that includes all of the, the strong growth that occurred last year, stronger than all of that. Um, and, and, and that brought the, the year over year growth rate from the 2.2% that you see here uh, to 3.6%. So, I mean, you're back at this sort of solid pace of retail growth uh, going forward. Um, and, and I think just generally speaking, when you look at the retail sector, most of the things that would support retail spending they're in a good place. Like job growth is still pretty solid. Wage growth is, is pretty good. Uh, and the stock market is, is, is up 16% this year. So, you know, towards the end of last year, there was a big collapse, but we, we regained most of that uh, over the past couple of months. And, and so, you know, I, I think the retail picture still looks pretty bright going forward. Now, the, the March data, I mean, not every month is going to look like March's big gain. Um, I, I still think some of March's strength was partially payback from February's weakness. Like there were, there were big snowstorms in February that took away from retail activity. So you get a boost in, uh, in March as you sort of uh, rebound from that. Um, but I do think that retail is, is going to be a pretty consistent, generally strong uh, source of freight demand going forward. Is the consumer holding the economy up right now? I mean, I, I know that's been sort of a trend, but, but uh, is, it, is it true this time? Well, it's... it's um, it's always going to be the case. I mean, it, when you think about consumer spending, it makes up two thirds of the economy. So, if you if you have consumer spending that's okay, chances are your economy is going to be fine unless you have just like an absolute collapse in investment in one of these other areas. Um, and so, I think that's going to continue to be the case that that you know consumer spending is going to drive things, uh, but that's just because it's such a big part of our economy overall. Uh, shifting gears and taking a look at, at trade performance, um, I think it's pretty clear that both goods import and export growth have, have downshifted from the, the rapid pace of growth seen last year. Uh, I mean, here the white line is, is goods exports year over year growth, and the orange line is imports growth year over year. And at, at various points in the second half of last year, you were talking about basically double digit growth on the import and export side. Now, some of that is, is tariff related, like there was a surge in the second quarter in exports to try to avoid tariffs. There was a surge towards the end of 2018 in imports to try to avoid potential tariffs. Um, and so it's, it, it caused some stronger growth than, than what you would have otherwise expected. Um, but I just think overall, there's, there's been a, a pretty clear downshifting there. Now, there was some pretty positive news, or at, at least it looked positive, that came out of the trade sector uh, yesterday morning. Um, it showed like the trade deficit narrowed, it showed exports growing, it showed imports also growing, which is good news for the economy. It's also normally good news for freight. Um, but I would say that, that uh, you know, when you dig into the details of the export results from yesterday, most of that was just like a surge in aircraft. Like, I mean, if it, there was a, a big jump of about 60% month to month in aircraft exports to the rest of the world. And if you take that out, there really wasn't much left. Like uh, export fare actually declined once you strip out the surge in, in aircraft exports. So, I mean, unless you're you're in, you're actively involved in moving these uh, these aircraft to the rest of the world, from a general freight perspective, I don't think the export sector is is, is looking that great. Um, on the import side, you know, as the economy comes up, has slowed down during the first quarter, I think that there there, there was a pullback in imports. <laughs> Um, again, there was a big surge at the end of 2018 to try to avoid tariffs and imports. And so part of the weakness during the first quarter in, in imports is, is payback for that. I mean, if you import earlier than you otherwise might, then when the time comes, you're not going to import as much as you normally would. Uh, and so as a result, it, imports have actually turned negative year over year. They're at negative 1% uh, year over year for goods exports. Um, but I do think that, you know, going forward, the import environment is not going to be as bad. And part of this is connected to retail. Like as retail rebounds and consumer demand rebounds after a sluggish first quarter, you should see better import growth coming out of it. On the export side, I, I think the picture is a, a, quite a bit bleaker. Like we're, we're really waiting for global growth to, to improve in order for exports to improve. Um, 
that as long as like Europe's growing at a pretty slow pace and China's growing at a pretty slow pace, then you're going to have a, a very tough export environment uh, to do business in. So uh, likely the exports are going to be weak until that situation changes. Um, just to reinforce some of that with survey data, this is also ISM data, uh, this is a, a couple of components. The white line here is uh, manufacturers' new export orders, and then the orange line is manufacturers' new import orders um, from the ISM data, and this runs through March. And, and, and you can see like the orange line, there was a, a, a big downshifting in, in imports from a, about October of last year all the way through February of this year. Uh, but then March's import data jumped up. Um, and so, you know, part of the reason why I expected that import growth is going to improve is because the survey data su suggests that uh, imports are, are going to begin to pick up going forward. The white line here, which is exports, you know, it, it's downshifted after after hitting the highs in the middle part of last year. Um, and it's it's been now, like it's, it's barely above the expansionary threshold of 50 right now. Um, and so again, I, I think that that the export environment is going to continue to be tough until you start to see better growth figures coming from the rest of the world. Looking at housing, um, here the white line here is building permits and the green line is housing starts in the economy. Um, one of the things I think is, is, is pretty apparent coming out of, out of housing starts is that the, you know, the, the trend has cl clearly turned down over the past several months. I mean, housing has been one of the more consistent weak areas for the economy overall, really since the beginning parts of last year, even when the rest of the economy was growing at a pretty strong pace, housing kind of lagged behind. Um, and I, I still think starts and permits are, are, are lagging. Um, part of it is structural. They, there's a, a, they have difficulty finding labor, much like trucking did once upon a time. And uh, they, there's also a shortage of developed lots to, to, to build on zoning issues that also restrain construction activity. So there's some structural things at play here. Um, on the demand side, I, I think the demand for housing is actually going to begin to pick up. Like as long as job growth is good and income growth is good uh, and mortgage rates are, are low, which mortgage rates have come, come down over the past couple of months, that should stimulate housing demand in the economy. Um, so I, I do expect that you'll start to see better housing data going forward, but you know, we're still going to be in this negative year-over-year -year territory for a while there. Even you know, as, as people start shifting to, to smaller communities and, and leaving some of the, you know, the West Coast and some of the congested areas on the West Coast and, and New York and stuff, do you think the zoning issues sort of go, they're less of an impact? Well, yeah, longer term, probably. Um, and, and there are also measures in place that would address some of the zoning issues. Like there's a bill in, in, in California now to, to relax some of the restrictions for, for some of the zoning restrictions that are there now to allow for more multifamily construction. Um, and so that should, should help ease things. Um, and I, I mean, just from a housing construction perspective, most of the housing starts that occur in the economy, they occur in the South. Like there, it's, a, it's, it's over half of the housing starts that, that go on in the economy overall, or just in the, in the South region. Um, plans cheaper. There's, there's I, lots of these kind of restrictions. I have a distorted perspective because back in Chattanooga, things do grow, but they, we haven't, we don't have zoning issues, plenty of land. Right, exactly. Space. Like it's, it's just, it's just easier to do here. Yeah. And when I lived in Texas, they would literally just, you know, they create a thousand homes in a new neighborhood. No, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and the prices are significantly different <laughs> as you go from one area to the other. Um, so all of this, the, like the retail outlook, the housing outlook is contingent on performance of the labor market. And there was a big scare last month because the, the job numbers came in very weak. There was, I mean, it was only 20,000 jobs that were added in February, or at least they had the initial reports for 20,000 jobs added. Um, and so people were like, well, you know, if that support goes, there's real concerns about the strength of the economy because you have to reevaluate where retail is going to stand and where housing is going to stand. But job growth rebounded pretty nicely in March. There was over 200,000 or close to 200,000 jobs added in March. Um, and some of the weekly data that comes out of jobless claims have been very low. So I, I think everything's fine on the labor market front. Like hiring is still going forward at a, at a decent pace. Uh, unemployment is still at these multi, near multi-decade lows. And, and earnings growth is, is still generally strong. So as long as this is the case, there's, there's decent fundamentals for retail spending, also for housing uh, demand in, in the economy. So that should help stabilize some things. 
uh, a bit of a different picture on the on the trucking side of things. Um, you know, I've, I've spent the better part of the last year talking about how fast the industry was adding workers uh, into the into it uh, in, in an attempt to try and uh, address the capacity crunch that emerged last year. Um, but trucking employment actually declined last month. It fell for the first time in nine months uh, in March. Um, and, you know, it, it feels like this may be a sign of things to come. You know, I've talked a bunch of, 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 of in the past about how employment usually trails activity, that activity dies down first, and then you start to see like the employment trends change. And so, you know, February's job growth for, for the trucking industry wasn't very strong. It was only 900 jobs added. And then March, you get an actual decline in, in jobs for, for trucking. Um, and so I'll be watching pretty closely over the next couple of months to see whether or not you get a reversal in the trend. I mean, a single month doesn't really um, mean a whole lot for any of these indicators. Like you get a bad month that'll emerge for any number of reasons. But I think a lot of the fundamentals are in play that, that say that, you know, that you're not going to see the same amount of hiring going on in the industry that you did over the last year or so. Uh, like the demand growth isn't as strong as it was last year. Uh, and there's also a, a sense that there's already enough capacity in the, in the market. So, so there's, there's no real reason to, to keep adding uh, drivers uh, the way that they did over the last year. Um, so, so that's the, a general summary of the first quarter. Like I said, the first quarter was pretty weak. Um, but I have a number of different reasons for why I think that there are better freight days ahead, why, why you know, the second quarter and the third quarter will be better, at least from a freight perspective, um, in terms of volume and growth. Um, so on the trade side, you know, I, I talked a bunch about how the export sector is struggling because global growth is slowing down. Uh, but the good news is China's already decided, started their stimulus to, to, to boost their economy back up. Um, and so you should start to see better growth numbers coming out of China. In fact, that, you know, March data coming out of China was, was already better than what it was in February. Um, but I think as the second quarter goes on and the third quarter goes on and the stimulus takes hold, you should start to see better growth coming out of China. Now that, that'll help Europe because a lot of things that get manufactured in Europe get sent to China, uh, but it'll also help the US and, and sort of trade uh, with China as you go forward. Uh, and there's also been rumblings that there might be a trade deal forthcoming between the U.S. and China. Um, I mean, you guys know my position on this kind of thing. It's very difficult to predict where policy is going to go these days. Um, but the Trump administration has been hinting for the past several weeks that they're getting close to some kind of deal uh, with China. Um, you know, that's it's, it's much more important that, that global growth picks up and you get any kind of resolution on tariffs but a resolution on tariffs would move things in a positive direction. So a good reason to suspect that export growth will begin to pick up a little bit. Um, now, again, I, I don't think you're, you're headed back to where we were in the middle part of last year from, from an export standpoint, but just stronger than what we've seen in recent months. On the retail side, you know, I already talked earlier about how retail struggled during the first quarter. Part of it was weather. I mean, you know, retail always struggles whenever there are snowstorms and, and things like that that hit the economy. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, the, the amount that, uh, of tax refunds that were issued this year were significantly lower than what it was uh, last year, especially during the early parts of the tax season. Like, the, you know, the February numbers were coming in. I mean, they were, you know, 15 to 17 percent lower than what they were. Is that a function of the new tax bill? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a function of the tax bill and the amount of withholdings that were going on over the course of last year. But the thing is, like those early filers, the people that are, you know, rushing to get their taxes done, they want their tax <laughs> refunds so they can go out there and spend it. Like it's not, it's not the people that are waiting to April 15 mm -hmm. to file that are going to be the ones that spend the big tax refund. It's the early filers that are expecting <laughs> something. And so part of the reason I think like February's retail data came in so poorly is because tax refunds were were significantly lower and people, you know, they realized they, they weren't going to have the couple thousand dollars they thought they were going to have to go spend on things. Um, the good news is that tax refunds have kind of uh, have picked up over the past couple of weeks. Uh, it's roughly in line where it was last year. Stock market's rising, uh, and so that should help things. Uh, and again, on the inventory side, we expect things to, to start flowing through the economy, uh, and, and that should drive more freight activity. Uh, and on the, on the housing side, um, I think it's important to note that like the housing sector has been hit by a series of weather events beginning last hurricane season uh, in, in August and September of last year. It was hurricanes followed by wildfires, uh, tornadoes, snowstorms, flooding, I mean, just a, one thing after another. 
and all of these things are not good for housing and construction activity. Like housing is one of the more weather sensitive areas of freight demand. Um, and so when you're looking at, at some of the recent housing performance, just keep in mind that there's weather at play here. And what that does is it builds up a lot of pent up activity that there, there are people that would have been building before uh, that just delayed it. And then there's also like a lot of rebuilding that has to happen. Like when, when there's flood damage and things like that, you have to, eventually you're gonna unleash that into restructure, uh, construction activity going forward. So some reasons to believe housing will begin to pick up also. Yeah, so uh, I think we're gonna dive into freight. Are you gonna to to continue this? Uh, just this last thing on freight rates. Um, you know, as, as Craig mentioned in the introduction, the capacity has been added to the market. I mean, it feels pretty clear that there's more capacity this year than what there was last year. Uh, and it's starting to manifest itself in, in, in terms of the rates that that we're seeing in the economy. Now, this is producer price index data. This is the price that-, that This is government data yes, specifically, right? That the, that the you know, producers receive for what it is that they <clears throat> provide. Um, and what you see is that the rates for long distance trucking, uh, which is the, the white line here, the growth is coming down very quickly, right? It was, it was near double digits or at double digits in the middle part of last year, but it's tumbled over the last three months. Uh, and it's now sitting at 4.9% and falling um, in terms of year over year growth. Uh, and a similar kind of story for long distance LTL trucking, that th those rates are, you know, the rate growth that you're seeing there is also coming down. Um, curiously enough, like, like local trucking rates have, have pulled up pretty steady. I, I, I would say that's probably structural for like the Amazon e-commerce, yeah. sort of the, plus you have competition from like the on-demand Ubers and the Lyfts where, where people uh, have alternative forms of employment. No, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so the local rates, I think the growth is holding up pretty well, but the other rates, they're coming down. And again, a lot of it is capacity related. And I think as capacity gets added, there's downward pressure on these rates. So getting into the freight market update, we're gonna dive into uh, some discussions. Um, if, if you looked at uh, volumes, I think this is a, I actually consider this encouraging. Um, one of the things that uh, we've seen in April is it doesn't feel this way, uh, but April volumes are on par uh, with 2018. Um, it doesn't feel if you own trucks right now, particularly if you're heavily exposed to the spot market, it feels very, very soft. Uh, but in reality, volumes as a, as a whole market have held up, which I think is, is actually encouraging. Um, and we talked a little bit about driver employment uh, and what that's doing as companies uh, are coming down in terms of uh, the amount of drivers they're hiring, uh, perhaps that will put some sanity into uh, the capacity map and there'll be some more strength, strength in the uh, pricing power of carriers. Um, outbound tender volume index, if you look at uh, areas where we're seeing uh, volumes lag year over year, uh, East Coast volumes are, are, are softer than what they were last year. Uh, Ibrahim uh, mentioned uh, could be some weather issues related to uh, activity there. Uh, could also be just structural parts of the economy. Uh, the areas where there were less refunds were actually along the Northeastern Corridor, which may have had an impact on freight demand in that area. Um, you know, the other uh, markets uh, that seem to be uh, struggling right now are uh, places like Joliet, Illinois. Um, a lot of what happened that drives the Joliet market is related to intermodal traffic uh, and intermodal uh, going from the uh, boxes on the trains into, uh, uh, into warehouses, into trucks. Uh, that's actually down 10% uh, year over year. Um, and uh, places like Atlanta are still struggling to get along. So West Coast is still driving the market. Uh, we see a lot of activity there. It did soften from where we were earlier this year and last year. Uh, most of that just related to import activity. Uh, companies uh, were filling their warehouses full of product and there was less uh, excess uh, demand uh, to go into the market. We're starting to see that play out particularly in the intermodal sector. Uh, and it's uh, certainly something to, to watch. Um, one of the things that Convoy has provided us uh, in partnership on this particular webinar is their market data. Uh, again, being a, in the digital marketplace, uh, their data uh, is more representative of what we recognize as the transactional spot market. Uh, all they do, they do have contractual freight. Uh, but if you look at it, it's pretty consistent with the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, there is excess capacity and drivers available in most of the market. The South Central uh, part of the United States is really the only area where you see a, 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 a market really at, at balance, but everything else is really just wide open green. Um, the refrigerated market has been tighter than the drive-in market. Um, and a lot of that 
uh, is just related to uh, uh, the fact that we had uh, uh, a lot of temperature, you know, much colder winters. We had a lot of uh, uh, stuff, uh, weather that happened uh, this, you know, people always think of refrigerated as being refrigerated, but in reality it should be, the proper term would be temperature control because a lot of what happens is during the winter, people put their freight that's, that is sen se temperature sensitive on the refer trailers to manage uh, temperature. And that's why that market has, has been tighter than normal. Um, but, but all in all, the market is fairly, fairly soft. California, as we mentioned, uh, does have uh, more elevated activity, uh, and that was consistent with what we saw in the latter half of, half of last year, although it's, it's softened a bit. Uh, looking forward, um, you know, if you sort of look at a forecast, it looks like 2019 is going to be, at least in the spot market, is going to be a pretty soft year related to freight. There should not be any sort of inflationary activity in rates. Uh, our data confirms that or, or, or suggests that. It looks like uh, Convoys does as well. And of course, our channel checks would, would also talk about that. Um, looking at Port City, you know, one of the uh, ways to sort of uh, understand the constructs of the freight market is to actually look at uh, the major port uh, cities in the United States. Uh, ports like Norfolk and Savannah, uh, certainly Southern California, uh, between LA and Long Beach and, and Seattle, um, they have really, that's really what kept the latter part of 18 alive. If you look at most of the market uh, along the midsection, take the intermodal sort of uh, 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 points of entry into the domestic trucking market, take the intermodal section out of the country uh, and only focus on sort of what's driven from the core part of the US, you didn't see a lot of activity. Uh, what drove the U.S. freight market last year was heavily related to ports and imports. Um, and we're still seeing that as a factor in uh, 2019. Um, and that seems to be consistent. Uh, so we're not seeing a lot of intra-U.S. Uh, and intra-sectional uh, uh, demand uh, that's driving it. And of course, LA, again, gets a lot of credit for driving um, the freight market today. Um, one of the things that we also looked at was actually trucks in market and comparing. So if you think of the freight market, particularly the spot market, the one that's, that's very fluid, um, and even the contract market, uh, carriers as, the, as their uh, quote unquote contract business uh, softens, they will start to flock uh, towards where there is high spot demand. Uh, and we see that in our indicators. One of the indicators we've created is trucks and market, which tracks ELD locations of trucks, uh, as well as uh, uh, ULSD gallons. And what we actually see is looking at Los Angeles is up 43% since last year. So as the market has softened, a lot of those trucks like sheep have gone out to LA to pick up freight. What is interesting is that volatility, that up and down mountain thing you see there, Ibrahim, that is related to trucks come in, get freight, and leave. They're, they're, they're not retained in that market. Uh, it's very fluid as weekends because a lot of the port activity yeah. happens intra-week, early part of the week, and, and, and so there's a lot of cycles in terms of what happens. That's why you see that up and down fluctuation. But we have seen a lot of growth of trucks entering the LA market since last year, taking freight. That has also kept tender rejections down. So while you see inflated volumes, you don't see it show up in the pricing data and you don't see it show up in the turndown data because the market has reacted. It's a rational market. Um, looking at Chicago uh, uh, as well as seeing some growth, not to the degree that we've seen it in LA, which suggests that uh, the LA phenomenon is specific to just high demand. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting thing. Uh, JB Hunt did its earnings uh, two days ago, I believe, uh, and they came out and of course, it's a bellwether of the trucking industry. It's the largest uh, domestic uh, freight company uh, that really has a, a, a very complete portfolio uh, of all uh, types of traffic. Intermodal is certainly uh, represented more in J.B. Hunt's earnings than really any other carrier. And they have reported some softness in the intermodal market. Um, this too, uh, if you look at the intermodal data that we have inside of Sonar, we see it as well. Um, looking at overall freight volume uh, in the US, uh, we're seeing volumes slightly up, but intermodal is down. And, and of course, 
uh, that is suggesting that uh, uh, shippers are finding because the spot market differential between intermodal and spot is the spot market's cheaper. They're just putting it on a truck. A truck from a service standpoint has a slightly uh, faster time and more direct route, less people handling it. And so uh, in a market where there's plenty of spot capacity, shippers will uh, tend to revert to the spot market. Now, it's one of the interesting things I think that came out last year was that when, when the trucking industry was really hit pretty hard by the capacity constraints, you know, where, where you found people complaining that they just couldn't find a truck to move the stuff that they needed to move. Um, it's when it almost did it its best. Like, uh, you know, you start as a manufacturer, you start to think to yourself, like, you know, can I afford to, for it to take longer uh, and, and move this stuff intermodal since I can't find a truck to, to do it. But now that kind of things are reversed and there, there seem to be plenty of trucks out there to, to move the freight. Now you don't need intermodal. I mean, you might as well get there faster. Yeah. I mean, it's time differentials is one element, the less handling, yeah. less, less, less uh, folks handling it and you can directly track it ideally means that in some ways it, it has some advantages. Um, this is getting back to what we had discussed in terms of uh, just national tender rejections, the uh, outbound tender rejection uh, indices that we track uh, is actually suggesting. These are regional outbound uh, tender rejections. So looking at the, the entire U.S., that shaded green mountain is the U.S. Um, the Southwest is the orange. Uh, so that's the Texas uh, market. And then Midwest, which is really your uh, center of the country up near uh, Chicago, I guess it's more the Ohio Valley, a couple of the Ohio Valley, the auto sector, the Rust Belt, uh, you would see uh, the purple activity. So we're seeing uh, higher or, or, or uh, higher rejections on a national basis um, or high, lower rejections, I'm sorry, on a national basis uh, than you do in the Midwest. We've seen what's interesting is that auto region, that Rust Belt, has actually picked up an activity in the last two weeks. And I, I don't know if you have, is that just an inventory year, year over year uh, auto, sh uh, auto manufacturer shifting out of inventory? Probably. Um, like the auto sales numbers have been de decent. The production numbers have been pretty poor so far this year. So, so they're that. trying to get rid of just all the inventory from their 2019 yes. uh, car edition. So uh, that could drive some activity between May and June. I guess it's a good time to buy a car, right? Sure. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, I can't even see wait what, times. Is that wait times? It's uh, the the things. Uh, Marion, is that it's wait time? Sorry, I apologize. The screen uh, I've got something covered it up. Uh, so this is average wait times. Uh, Convoy is reporting that average wait times on their uh, app have gone down since the since uh, 2018. We have actually seen uh, slightly different factors, and we've seen that wait times have gone up. I wonder if it's just a function of more efficiency and how that the, the fact that the visibility there is sort of changing how carriers are managing the freight this Well, one of the things you can see here is like there there has been a, a pickup in the wait times over the last couple months, right? Like uh, I mean, it, it really bottomed out in 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 January, and now it's coming coming back. It up. is trickling back if you look yeah, at the chart, which is partially what we see in our data, right? Like the, as as kind of capacity is, is more plentiful, you, you find. Well, I, I, I noticed that we, we took it out of the original edits when we did this at the last edit was that the February number saw, saw high increase in uh, detention times and then yes. sort of reverted back to in March. That could be a function of software freight markets. Yes. And also weather has an impact on it sure. as, uh, as, as companies shift and, and manage weather. Uh, national spot rates, if you're looking at national spot rates and comparing year over year, uh, this is really um, a, a real way to sort of understand the demand of the market uh, because spot rates are, are much more exposed to direction of both the, the supply and demand elements uh, of the market. You can see that spot rates are trending back to really a normalized pattern um, and really close to where they were uh, over from, the, from really 15 to 2017. 2018, in many ways, is an anomaly. Uh, you see this massive surge in activity and, and price, and really happened at the tail end of 17, uh, half of, the second half of 17, all the way to the 18. You saw really high spot rates. Uh, that has come back down. If you look at the shaded mountain region, that green uh, region, uh, it looks like spot rates are really going back to where they were, and we're going back to a level where uh, the market is much less volatile than it used to be. Uh, this is an interesting thing we discovered. We just added from ACT, uh, added 
truck orders of new class eight trucks. We have it by different classes and certainly class eights. And then we started comparing uh, the DAT van rates against truck orders. And what we found is a very tight correlation that's about a month shifted. So if you shifted the DAT rates by a month out, uh, then that actually uh, almost, you could almost put those charts together. It would look like a, a puzzle piece. Uh, and what that suggests is that uh, as spot rates are good, drivers and carriers feel really, really good about uh, their, the sentiment of the market. They end up ordering trucks. And as the market uh, spot rates drop, then guess what? They stop ordering trucks and they cancel the orders. And so we see that in the data. It just suggests that spot rates are really a highly reflective way of what drives the capacity map of the market. And you can actually see that in uh, the shifting of, of the market. What's encouraging from a long-term capacity standpoint for pricing power if you're a carrier is that the market's rational. And as uh, because we don't have the massive surge of, in spot rates, you're not having the massive surge of capacity additions. That also might be why we're seeing employment numbers start to, to have peaked and, and drop off. Um, we're also seeing one of the other indicators that we track uh, is related to container rates out of China. Uh, container spot rates are starting to recover. You mentioned trade seems like it's 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 at least stable at this point, and, and um, uh, we're seeing some activity. Uh, rates are higher to the west coast from China uh, versus last year. They're actually up 56 percent from last year. Uh, so I think that's certainly suggesting that consumers and, and uh, importers are continuing to import freight. And of course, we see that drive the domestic freight map uh, as it looks at uh, the port activity. Uh, diesel prices, always a favorite of, of the market because uh, it's, it's what provides the liquidity of uh, the trucking market. And one thing to point out is that diesel prices as WTI and as diesel, uh, as oil has tracked up, uh, so have diesel prices have followed. Uh, we track both retail, the uh, diesel truck stock retail prices. We track the Department of Energy assessment, which is really based on retail prices, as well as rack prices. And we're seeing that, you know, rack prices move in tandem with the, the NYMEX uh, oil contracts on the New York Mercantile Exchange. Uh, we've seen those come back to levels that are really close to where they were in November. Uh, the retail prices did start to slowly uh, drop, bottomed in February and are trickling back up. Uh, but the spread between the wholesale price of diesel and the retail price of diesel has recently narrowed uh, and that will impact first quarter earnings of, of the larger carriers that have that are buying diesel on wholesale just because they don't have the benefit fit of the fourth quarter uh, spreads. Um, one of the things also, I, I thought this was interesting, sort of telling what you had, you had talked about was looking and comparing uh, hourly earnings rate uh, data. Uh, this is actually your, I think your slide's a little bit out of order, uh -huh. uh, but um, uh, average hourly earnings uh, for carriers are for people in the transportation warehousing business versus employment in the trucking sector. And you can see that as employment has peaked up, Earnings, it, it, it lagged a little bit, but now we're seeing that they're moving tandem with really tight labor markets. Uh, air cargo rates, in terms of what's happening in the air cargo market, uh, it, uh, rates from uh, really Europe to the United States have dropped uh, just because of trade fluctuations, slowdown of imports from Europe uh, to the United States and, and a lot of lift capacity that's available there. But we're seeing higher rates out of uh, Asia into North America and rates have gone up. In fact, in the last month, uh, the Hong Kong to North American uh, uh, air freight index, our cargo index is up 12%, which is suggesting, you know, what drives that uh, is a lot of electronics, electronic and semiconductor prices uh, and semiconductor demand will continue to go up. Um, it just looks like companies are, are, are buying a lot of technology. So just to wrap up, I mean, I think overall, when you're thinking about the market, just keep in mind that the economy struggled in the first quarter, but I think especially in, in terms of freight and freight movements, you should you should find yourself in a better overall macroeconomic environment going forward. And I talked about the, the, a few reasons why freight activity should be stronger in the second and third quarter than it was in the first. Um, you know, one of the things to keep an eye on is the, is the trucking employment uh, data. 
Again, it, it, it fell for the first time since the early part of 2018. Um, one month isn't a trend, um, but the, the sort of surrounding conditions suggest that this, this thing, you know, th this kind of pattern may continue. Um, so something to keep an eye on when thinking about capacity in the market. Um, but overall, capacity is higher this year than what it was last year. Uh, and that combined with demand growth that's slower than what it was at this time last year should put some downward pressure on rates, even if the volume growth improves, which I think it's going to do in the second and third quarter. So uh, just, uh, I'll go ahead and take it, Marianne. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're Thanks, guys. Figure out studio, so uh, <laughs> she's on the other side of the room. So I'll finish this and close it out uh, before we get a couple questions. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, evening him and I will, will be together. Uh, our team of market experts will be together in Atlanta on May 6th. So you can still get access to tickets. We're running out. Capacity's tight. A lot of great speakers. And I think we want to move to questions right now. So thank yeah. you, everyone, for coming. Absolutely. And thank you guys. And thanks for bearing with us. Those of you on the line, it's growing pains, but it's going to be better than ever before. So thanks for sticking with us through it. Um, first question that came through, um, this came through just a few moments into the presentation. I get that rates are falling, but is that from a place of strength or are they truly deflated? Are they truly, I don't, I, that's a, are they truly deflated? I, I, I think the slide of spot rates going back to where they were in 17, I, I think what happened is you had this just massive run up of this high, if you will, in 18, uh, that has perverted back to the normal condition. I'd say this is normal conditions. We have freight, uh, freight that's growing not at the level we would want to see, uh, but freight's growing slightly. Uh, but capacity has, has grown faster. I don't think, and, I, and there's a lot of carers that will shoot me for saying this, I don't think 18 long-term was a healthy trend for anybody because what it did was a lot of under operators went and added a bunch of capacity and actually every carrier added capacity when they looked at high rates thinking this is a, is a long-term trend when it actually didn't serve to be that. What we would have wanted to see for more st stability was a more gradual surge, but of course we didn't get that. Yeah, I mean, I would only add that I think a lot of this year is going to be a normalization of things. Like, I mean, you have to come down from this idea of, of, of that, you know, 2018 was so abnormal in a number of ways. And there's going to be a process of adjustment to get back to where things normally would be. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, what's going on with rates now is, is, is a part of that, that kind of trend. I mean, there was, there was a jump in rates that came because, <laughs> because there, there really was much more demand than there was supply out there. And as you as you get back to a more normal environment, there's going to be some some downward movements there along the way. I, I think a trucker in 2015 would kill for 2019 market. Okay. I mean, it's just it's that strong. Yeah. Great. Okay. Next listener says, agreed with a great info here. We are actively looking for tools to use that show the trends here. DIT is helpful, but similar to Wall Street, we think there could be a live resource out there. Any thoughts here? Uh, for example, the CAS index is helpful, but also not live. Well, I, I, I don't know who wrote this, uh, but it sounds almost like too much of a layup, uh, Marianne. Uh, but so certainly we would argue that Sonar is a, a great dashboard. The charts that you've seen is in, are in Sonar. Our market experts provide uh, data commentary by email, as well as we have Freightways uh, uh, now that's every day at 4 p.m. So that data is live. Uh, we're also talking about a uh, over-the-top TV network, which will provide broadcast television. I believe that was an it was that an internal question I have to ask. It wasn't. Okay. Well, whoever that is, we talked to our sales folks. They love it. So sorry to be a bit salesy, but it was, too, it was too good. Could you elaborate on what has happened to the auto freight? We ran last year on automotive parts and has decreased and seems to not be coming back. I, I you know, I think we have had some discussion about this, Ibrahim and I have. I'll, I'll start. I think auto talking to folks that are in uh, the automotive markets, it is, it seems like it's in a decline. Peak auto is behind us. Um, people are not buying as many automotive uh, automobiles as they did in the past when they take a good care of on demand transportation. Um, so that's one view of it. Um, yeah, I, I would, I mean, I agree with that. I, like, um, I do think that the auto industry, especially in terms of just like passenger cars and things like that, there's going to be less demand going forward in terms of sales. But the other thing that I would add is that, um, you, you know, I, I talked a little bit about how there's, it feels like we're getting pretty close to a trade deal with China and there, you know, there may not be tariffs anymore on, on Chinese imports. Um, 
but people seem to forget that like there was there were terrorists before we had a trade war with China on steel and aluminum, um, which were they, they weren't just implemented on, on China. They were implemented on a lot of uh, a lot of uh, countries, and you know there's no real talk of those things going away. Um, and, and so the, you know the the auto industry is feeling the effects of steel and aluminum tariffs more than other industries might. Um, and so part of the reason why things are, are, are still fairly weak on the production side is because those, those tariffs are still in place and they're, they're taking some hold on, on some of the key inputs into the production process. Cool. All right, next question. Any early indications for how produce season is shaping up? Uh, produce weather. I mean, weather is the story from produce. Uh, specifics, I, I don't have any specifics today, but certainly the weather has been a major impact on uh, yeah, and um, so weather is, is part of it. So I mean, the the poor weather that we've had is going to it's going to make it, uh, I think, a little bit sort of a softer produce season than, than most. At least softer from the, the amount of produce flowing through. The other thing I would add is that um, you know that we mentioned really briefly there was talks about closing the border to, to Mexico. Oh, they, they 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 haven't closed the border to Mexico, and I, I don't think it's very realistic that they do. But what has happened uh, across the U.S. and Mexico border is that things have slowed down quite a bit. If you're moving things um, between those two countries, but the amount of delays is uh, significantly higher than what they normally are. Uh, that has implications. A lot of what we import from Mexico is, is, is produce. I mean, there's, there's autos, uh, auto parts, and then there's a good amount of produce that comes from, from Mexico. So it has implications um, for the amount that flows through the U.S. economy. Awesome, and we are right up on time, but we're gonna give it a couple more minutes since we were a little bit late getting started. We have just a couple more questions here. Has anyone quantified how much capacity has increased in drive-in in 2019 Q1 versus 2018? Yeah, that's a great question. I think every body is trying to figure that out. Um, if you look at sort of the growth of the entire capacity from 18, just to say 18, the last uh, number, uh, that we we checked into the first quarter from sort of the hard ELD mandate. Um, you do get projections as low as three percent. I I sort of subscribe to a, a higher number of six to eight percent, um, uh, which meets uh, if you look at the fundamental uh, softness and turn uh, to the rejections, uh, that seems to be very consistent. One thing we don't know, and I don't know that anybody can quantify it except the folks that are at Amazon, is how much of an impact. Uh, Amazon creating its own organic fleet uh, is in terms of taking out some of that retail peak demand uh, and actually attracting some of the owner operators over to their market. And so it's hard to actually quantify that, uh, but that certainly has, a, has an impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. There's the big part of, uh, that you miss in the visibility into that sort of thing is the private fleet the side of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, And one of the things that emerged last year is that, uh, I mean, some of these retailers got Got creamed by the by their by their transportation costs in the beginning parts of 2018, and as a result, they kind of went in and they, they began investigating whether or not they needed to build up their own private fleets. Uh, so Amazon's part of it. I don't think they are the only ones that decided to to, to kind of build up their own capacity to, to move uh, things around. And and unfortunately, there there's no real way that I know of to to be able to quantify exactly yeah, how much of that is going on. Driver employment, FMCSA, but the, the problem is government data. It, well, right, exactly. <laughs> like even that is going to be pretty pretty lagged by the time you get a view of it. We do one of the indicators we do look at is as diesel consumption, uh, and that has sort of given us some indicator, and that's where we came up with a higher number than six to eight percent. That ULSD consumption data uh, is about as is, is, is of anything on a national basis about as close to anything I can find to, to identify capacity or to, to capacity data. Right. <clears throat> okay. And carriers of any size still have empty trucks to fill. So if those are financed, then they need to be filled to generate revenue. Thus, capacity will continue to grow to a degree, even if demand is really not there. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> so I will tell you something I always tell our staff, particularly folks that are not in the industry, uh, or if they haven't been on the asset side of things that is not well known, is that asset-based carriers are not as concerned about rate per mile as they are about utilization. So that revenue per truck per week, or in our case, we track revenue per driver to normalize for teams, that revenue per truck, per revenue per driver per week is the single most important indicator. And what happens is that uh, fleets will take freight at either cost or even below cost, as long as it covers their variable cost, in a, in a softer market. Uh, they will also run trucks empty. Uh, added markets run uh, trucks in at a very low rate per mile to shift into a higher demand market, which is what's happened in LA. 
is we're seeing trucks come into like the Bay Area, seeing trucks go into uh, Nevada and, and Arizona, and we'll run empty or at below uh, market rates into California to take advantage of the high demand. And I actually think that's impacting intermodal activity quite a bit because uh, the the owner operator capacity is willing to take stuff at such cheap rates out west to get a hold of the west coast fleet. Awesome. All right, and we'll take one more here. We've noticed increases in private fleet counts through the mm -hmm. DOT. To what extent do you think this will impact the four higher freight market? Yeah, Ibrahim, you uh, you actually teed this one up. I swear, <laughs> these questions are are being the Um You want to take us? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, and it's like I said before. You know, 2018 was a wake up call, I think, for a lot of companies when, when the bottom line came and they noticed that like transportation costs really hurt their profit margins for the year. And, and when that kind of thing happens, it, it basically forces them to reevaluate whether or not they need to, to bring things in house or keep operating on the for higher side of things. Um, and so, you know, the more they, that, that these companies build up sort of their own private fleets, the, the less there's going to be out there for, for the for higher side of things. And so, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about like the amount of volume that's out there, I mean, it may not necessarily be that like the economy is falling apart. It may just be that more of that stuff is moving in house. And like I said, Amazon is a, Amazon is a great example because they're, they're so big and, and, you know, you can, you can sort of feel the presence when they decide to do things like that. But they, they, they did a lot of that. I mean, they, they went out and they said, well, you know, we're just going to move more stuff ourselves. Uh, and people that used to carry that no longer do. Our channel checks have said they're at over 10,000 trailers. To, uh, supposedly by 20, 2020, if the numbers uh, correct, by over 40,000 euros. They're talking about massive amounts of additions to their network. And that, that at some point, you know, we're talking about a company as big as Amazon and, and just the market share that they gained in the retail market yep. is having an impact to on peak, peak demand. Awesome. Well, that is all that we have for today, guys. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to listen in. Thank you to our partners at Convoy and to Craig and Ibrahim for being here to share your insights with us today. As Craig mentioned, we are getting very close to our Transparency 19 event, which will be May 6th through 8th in Atlanta. Till the end of this month, tickets are $17.95, but on May 1st, the price is increasing to $24.95. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, be sure to check those out at Transparency 19. Com. Thanks so much again for being here with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next month. Thank you.